Good afternoon, everyone. My name is David. I am a park guide at the Ulysses S. Grant National Historic Site in St. Louis, Missouri, and I'm here today to present a program on Ulysses S. Grant, a president committed to civil rights. So we're going to talk a lot about civil rights and what that means today. I want to start us off with an essential question. And I want to introduce this essential question, but first I want to pull up our slide. Okay, there it is. So our essential question that I want you to keep in mind today is to what extent is it, is it okay to infringe on the rights of one group to protect the rights of another? So we'll look at that a little bit as we go throughout the lesson. First of all, I want to ask you all, I know some of you are younger than others and some of you are a little bit older, so I want to get your knowledge. What do you all know about Ulysses S. Grant already? And if we can select maybe one of the schools to tell me what they know about him already. Why is he famous? Why would we know this guy's name? Okay, it looks like we have some hands up at Youngblood. Raise your hand if you know something. Okay. So I hear somebody. Who's talking to me? Kelly. All right, I'm Kathy Tran. Hi, Kathy. And, okay. <laughs> okay. Um, Ulysses S. Grant was a war general that fought for the Union. Mm -hmm. What else do we know about this guy? Does anybody else know what other role Ulysses S. Grant served? He wasn't only a general, although that was one of his important roles. I think I'm looking at international school. You all have a lot of red and pink t-shirts. Looks like we've got some folks raising their hands there. Can I get a volunteer from uh, the group with the red shirts there to come up and uh, tell me what other job Mrs. S. Grant had, what, what other important role he had to play? Um, he was the president. Yeah, he was our president. Do you remember which number president he was? The 18th. 18? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so Grant was our president. Grant was our president, but he was also a Civil War general. So those are two things we know about Grant so far. In the past, you may have studied Ulysses S. Grant and Civil War, but today we're here to study Grant's presidency and his impact on civil rights. But first, we need to go back in time before the presidency and before the Civil War. And I'm going to turn my camera and show you something here at the historic Maybe just one moment, please. Hold on, we're having technical difficulties. Let me see if I can turn my camera for you. And we just want to point it out the window and show you all where I am. I am here at the Ulysses Grant Historic Site, and we have the home where Grant lived before the Civil War. Oops. My camera's going the wrong way. Hold on. Okay. It's kind of rainy. Kind of a rainy day here in St. Louis. Yeah, so my camera's not really cooperating, but you all can kind of see the home there in the picture. Can you all see that? Give me a thumbs up if you can see it. I know it's just coming into view. All right, you all can see that? Cool. All right, so I'm going to put back on me here. Give me just one moment. I had some presets, but they're not working right now. All right. Okay. All right, can you, can you get more of my head in the frame there? Yeah. All right, so you got to see the house. You were looking at a house known as Whitehaven, where Ulysses and Julia Grant lived. They raised a family, and it's also where Grant first encountered slavery on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh-oh. Grant's experiences with slavery at Whitehaven certainly shaped his views on civil rights, as well as, the free, as, well as freedom, and likely impacted his decisions as a politician later in life. Other 
right in it, it wants to go that way. <laughs> now we're going to uh, watch a short video. It's a film entitled Sunlight and Shadows, which I hope will illuminate the role of the enslaved here at Whitehaven, which was considered a southern plantation and was run using slave labor. So now the folks at the bridge are going to queue up the video. Hopefully all will be able to see that. And uh, afterwards we'll talk a little bit more about what you learned. And why he's living here, he's also living among dozens of African American slaves. The person that would eventually lead to the destruction of African American slavery in the 1850s is working side by side with those same African Americans that eventually his actions will flee in the 1860s. Ulysses and Julia loved this place, this home. Julia talks about, you know, the sunlight and happiness for all who, who lived here. And yet there's this other parallel story that has been in the shadows. Julia knows that there is slavery here. It's a big part of her life. But she, at the same time, she also thinks that the health rate itself. I don't want people to walk away from this site thinking that the house ran itself. The conditions that they were in was unjust. It was emotionally cruel. But at the same time, when you say, oh, that was sad, and then we move on, it doesn't show the leaps and bounds that people made to get out of these situations. In Missouri at the time, African Americans, whether they were free or enslaved, were not allowed to read or write. And yet we had evidence that they were learning to do that here at Whitehaven and hiding those things because they had been underneath the floorboards in the winter kitchens. We talk about how children were playing down here and the importance of reading and writing with the slate pencils, but the African beads is one of the biggest testament to how these people were trying to hold on to something outside of and way bigger than the institution that they were in. The African bead traveled through multi-generations. I'm sorry, um, I don't know if it's just us, but we're having a lot of trouble hearing the video. Grant takes away from this experience a more profound hatred. It's a little quiet on my end, too. See. I I can't turn it up, it's as loud as it goes. Actions as general okay. and a commitment to civil see what rights I as the 18th president of the United States. And this is an aspect that Grant has often forgotten, misunderstood, that he was one of our greatest civil rights presidents in American history. My oft expressed desire is that all citizens, white or black, native or foreign born, may be left free. President Grant risked public backlash by emphatically affirming his unqualified support for the 15th Amendment, a constitutional amendment which guarantees citizens the right to vote regardless of race, color, or previous servitude. His actions laid the foundation for future generations. This is everybody's history, and it is not just a white and black history either. When people come here, there's something that they take away. My hope is that they can see themselves in the stories uh, that we tell here. There's nothing quite as powerful in respect to the educational experience as standing where these great historical figures once stood. And by visiting these national parks, visitors have that opportunity. And in so doing, I think we gain a much greater understanding of who we are as a country and who we are as a nation. Okay, so you've all just seen the video. Can everybody hear me again? Give me a thumbs up if you can hear me. All right, everybody can.
can hear me and can everybody see me? Yes, all right, thumbs up if you can see me. All right, I think we're back on. So you all just watch that video. I know some people had a hard time hearing it. I know some of the audio wasn't cutting through okay. Uh, but for those of you who could hear and see the video, what did you learn from that video? that you maybe didn't know about Ulysses S. Grant before. And I want to take a few responses. Just raise your hand if you learned something new about Ulysses S. Grant or this property from the video. Okay, it looks like we've got some students, again, at Youngblood, I believe. Um, Youngblood, what about that group that's just the four people sitting around the table? Does anybody? Does anybody at the group sitting around the table have an answer? Okay, what about that group that that would be Birchwood. That would be Birchwood. Okay. So let's see. Uh, Birchwood, if, if we want to have somebody come up and tell us what you learned from the video, that'd be great. Um, I learned that the, the slaves were had to keep secret about learning how to read and write. Yeah, so there was a law passed in Missouri that actually declared that it was illegal to teach slaves to read and write at this time in history. So a lot of the slaves, after that point in time, started learning to read and write secretly, right? So we know that that was something that was happening here at Whitehaven. Did you all learn anything else new about Ulysses Grant? Looks like we might have some folks with the red shirts raising their hands. Well, we learned that Ulysses S. Grant was a uh, was against slavery before he was in the Civil War. Okay, cool. All right. So, as you learn, Grant had a lot to do with civil rights. In today's program, we're going to talk about the impact of Grant's presidency on civil rights, including the introduction of the 15th Amendment, which is mentioned in that movie, and his success in quelling the Ku Klux Klan and other white supremacy organizations, which is something he's also known for. So, first of all, I want to try an activity. So I'm going to ask you all a question, and I want you to come up with an answer for this. And maybe I can pick out just one or two people to answer for me. I want you all to describe a situation, and I'm sure you've had one, where you felt that you were being treated unfairly and had no choice in the matter, or way to change it. And what did you do in that situation? So if we can have somebody raise their hand and volunteer to come and tell us a story about when they felt they were being treated unfairly and felt like they had no way to get out of it. Okay. What about Lovett Elementary? Have we heard from you yet? All right, I'm going to have somebody step up to the mic and just hit that mute button and turn your mute off, and then somebody can give me a little response. <laughs> All right, tell me about a time you felt you were being treated unfairly. When I had to move. When I had to move. <laughs> when you had to move? Okay. Yes. And uh, you felt like you were powerless in that situation, right? You, Maybe your parents or your guardian said, hey, we're moving to a, a different place, and that's up to us, and you don't have any choice in the matter. Is that kind of how it went down? Yes. Yeah? How did that make you feel? It kind of made me feel down. It made me feel sort of down. <laughs> Sort of down, yeah. yeah. It feels like you're put down, right? Like somebody's telling you what to do, and you don't have a lot of power or choice in the matter. So, in the aftermath of the Civil War, the slaves, these former slaves, were in a similar situation where they had little say in how they were treated, even though they were no longer enslaved. When Grant started his presidency in 1869, he had a number of civil rights issues to deal with. And we're going to look at a PowerPoint slide and take a look at some of those issues. 
After the end of slavery with the 13th Amendment, newly freed African American slaves faced challenges, excuse me, faced new challenges and hurdles. Can you all think of any possible hurdles that they may have faced? Well, there was the lack of right to vote, and therefore, of course, the lack of representation that comes with voting. They faced unemployment and employment under harsh, harsh sharecropping systems. A lot of former slaves were homeless after the Civil War. Now, the Freedmen's Bureau actually provided food, housing, and medical aid, and established schools and offered legal assistance. So the Freedmen's Bureau did a lot for these former slaves. Unfortunately, they were shut down by Congress in 1872, just as Grant was starting to begin his second term as president. Racism also didn't end with the end of slavery. Black codes were also instituted. Have you all heard of black codes before? Just raise your hand if you've heard of black codes before. Okay, it looks like some of you are familiar with that and some of you maybe not so much. So let me read you the definition that I have of black codes. Black codes were laws passed by Southern states in 1865 and 1866 after the Civil War. These laws had the intent and the effect of restricting African Americans' freedom and of compelling them to work in a labor economy based on low wages and or debt. So black codes essentially kept African Americans put down, as our volunteer said, from one of those schools. That's how he felt when he moved these slaves. These former slaves also felt put down during this time because of all of these uh, hurdles that they faced. Now, white supremacy groups such as the White Leagues and the Ku Klux Klan were formed around the same time as well. The Ku Klux Klan was founded in 1866. It extended into almost every southern state by 1870. It became a vehicle for the white southern resistance to the Republican Party's Reconstruction era policies aimed at establishing political and economic equality for African Americans. In 1866, the Klan's first leader, or Grand Wizard, was Nathan Bedford Forrest, who was, you may have heard of him, a former Confederate general during the Civil War. Members of the Ku Klux Klan waged an underground campaign. What do you guys think when I say underground campaign? What do you think that means? Yeah, somebody at, I think they're on the top of the split screen here. Is that Lovett? I think it might be Lovett. Somebody in a green shirt raising their hand. Somebody's in a green shirt raising their hand. If you can step up here and just tell us. What do you think it means? to have an underground campaign. What do you think we mean by the word underground? We're not actually talking below the earth. Um, under the table or something like that? Yeah, under the table, like, yeah, kind of like out of the watchful eye, right? These people are being very secretive about what they're doing, but they're still doing it. So these members waged an underground, thank you very much. These members waged an underground campaign of intimidation and violence directed at white and black Republican leaders and African Americans in general. Next, we're gonna look at another slide and I actually have a political cartoon to look at. Here we see a political cartoon by the famous 19th century cartoonist Thomas Nast. In the 19th century, political cartoons were much more detailed than the political cartoons of today. Furthermore, because period printing techniques did not allow photographs to print well in newspapers, cartoons were also more prominently featured in the news. In 1862, Thomas Nast joined the staff of a widely read publication known as Harper's Weekly as an artist. He worked for the publication for roughly 25 years. Early in his career there, Nast earned acclaim for his depictions of the Civil War. President Abraham Lincoln, whom more than likely you've heard of, described him as the best recruiting sergeant for the Union cause because his sketches encouraged others to join the fight. And so I hope this quote from Lincoln sheds light on the impact that political cartoons had around the time of the Civil War. Now I want to ask you all a question. When you look at this political cartoon by Thomas Nast, 
What do you all notice? What are some things you can pick out from this cartoon? Okay, and it looks like we have some hands raised at what school do you think that is? The one with all the, the red shirts. The one with the, all the red shirts. It looks like we've got quite a few hands raised there. Does somebody want to come up and tell us what do you notice in that cartoon? I'll take a couple of responses from different groups. <laughs> okay. Um, the Ku Klux Klan is shaking hands with a, another person. And, uh -huh. and the people inside that thing with Jabber are like scared and yeah. Yeah, what kind of posture do they have? Frightened. Frightened, right? They're kind of kneeling down, they're looking, they're looking down, they're looking down because they're frightened of these people, right? So they're scared. What else do you notice? Anybody else have a response for us? If you do have a response, instead of raising your hand, it might be easier if you just walk up to the camera for me, okay? So if you have a response, go ahead and walk up to the camera and uh, let me know what you think. Okay? Okay, we've got some folks at Young Club. Um, that, you know? those cool clothes, those cool the Ku cool Klux Klan, are, um, are teaming up with the slave owners and um, um, by uh, making a deal and the slave, um, the uh, people um, looking down are like trapped inside in like um, a, a seal or deal or something. Yeah, yeah, good point, good point. Those are all great observations. How about, um, looks like it's the middle bottom screen. Got somebody standing there by the camera. I'm not sure what school you all are. A young girl. It's got a young girl standing at the screen. You gotta turn on your um, mute there. Um, so I think that the, that the thing that they are doing is a, they want it, they want to get rid of slavery and they will kill anybody to do it. Okay, now that's an interesting observation, but do you all think that these people are trying to get rid of slavery? Or does it look like they're trying to maybe even recreate slavery in a different form? Can, can, you see, can you see the words that we're highlighting right now? With the mouse, we're kind of pointing at some words. Can you all see what that says? Kind of pixely, but um, it says worse. It says worse than slavery. All right, so we're talking about a time after slavery, and those two people that you're looking at are actually members of white supremacy organizations. One man is a member of the KKK. You can actually see the KK on his um, white robe. And the other man is wearing a cartridge box. That's where soldiers would keep their bullets. He kind of looks like he's dressed like a Confederate soldier, but his cartridge box says White League, which is another white supremacy organization at that time. And there were a few other things that I noticed as well. For instance, you may notice in, within that shield, within that little circle shield shape in the middle of the cartoon, in the back left corner, do you all notice that tree shape with a person hanging from the tree? I think we're moving the mouse over it right now. You may have noticed that man, he's being lynched. That was one of the actions taken by these uh, white supremacy, anti-African American groups. Um, of course, you'll notice that the people in the picture, the, the two people standing outside of the shield shaking hands, are armed with guns and knives, but of course, they are still hiding their faces, which goes back to this idea of an underground movement, right? They're suggesting secrecy with this cartoon. And if you look at the um, other corner of that shield, just opposite from the person who's being lynched, you, you might notice a schoolhouse, and it's actually in flames. Why do you think that was? I'll just take a response from one of the groups here. If you think you know why the schoolhouse is in flames, come on up to the camera and let us know. Yeah, somebody, uh, okay. 
Looks like we've got a girl in a blue shirt coming to the screen. Um, it was a school of black kids. Hmm? It was a school right. of three black kids. Mm -hmm. And why do you think it's on fire? Because the two men out there set it on fire. Exactly, right? Now, why do you think they set the school on fire? Because that's really important. So, why do you think they set it on fire? To kill well, and stop education. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to stop education, right? Kind of going back to what we learned in the film, education was a big part of freedom for these former slaves, right? Becoming educated was a way of moving on with your life, seeking new opportunities, and by destroying the school, these people from the Ku Klux Klan and the White Leagues were certainly stamping down education for African Americans. So there's a lot of things going on in that cartoon. Otherwise, I also noticed the phrase, this is a white man's government, the phrase, the union as it was, and they're referring to before the Civil War when slavery existed. And then, of course, we talked about the posture of the African-American couple who's crouching with a child, which kind of suggests defeat. So I want to look at some of the amendments, some of the presidential amendments um, to the Constitution that were passed um, to help these African-Americans. So first of all, there was the 14th Amendment. The 14th Amendment was passed after the Civil War, and therefore it's known as a Reconstruction Amendment. A time after the Civil War was known as Reconstruction. So we look at this amendment, and you can see that it basically guaranteed that all persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the states wherein they reside. No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of the citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process law of law, nor deny to any person without uh, jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. So I know that's a long uh, a long amendment, but basically what it means is that these former slaves were given their citizenship after the Civil War and after the passage of the 13th Amendment, which guaranteed their freedom. The problem with the 14th Amendment? Well, the problem was that it did not guarantee these brand new citizens the right to vote. Now, how would you feel if, uh, let's say, you became a citizen, and most of you are citizens of this country, I'm betting, but you would not have the right to vote, and somebody else was going to make all the decisions for you. How does that make you feel when somebody else gets to make all the decisions? And you can just step up to the, to the camera if you, if you want to um, talk with us. Okay, um, it would make... Got somebody in the pink shirt there? Okay, make sure you turn your mute button off. Um, that would make me feel really sad, and I don't think it's fair that they weren't allowed to vote. Yeah, voting's a big, important step in being a citizen of the United States. We all have a say in how this country is run. But right after the Civil War, those slaves were guaranteed their citizenship, but they were denied the right to vote, which to me does not sound like full citizenship. But that's just me. What do you all think? I know we've got some a girl in an orange shirt, it looks like, ready to tell us what she thinks. Um, I think that we should all have the right to vote, even if you're a different race or color. And it wasn't really very fair for them to do that. Yeah, because a lot of other people, all the other men in this country at that time, had the right to vote. But African American men were excluded specifically because of their race. So you're right, it's not really very fair. So, here comes Grant. Now, President Grant started his presidency in 1869, and one of the first things he worked on was the passage of the 15th Amendment. The 15th Amendment, we bring it up here guaranteed that the right of the citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. 
So this kind of fares things up a little bit. Now, what group is excluded from that? On a side note, what group is excluded from that? I'm sure you're all thinking, I said all American men, right? Women were excluded from that right to vote until the 20th century. Uh, but during this time, as after the passage of the 15th Amendment, all American men had the right to vote. And that was a big step taken by Grant in a piece of legislation that he pushed thoroughly during the first term of his presidency. So what were the results? Well, based on what we've learned, what we've learned so far, what do you think the Reconstruction Amendments meant for African Americans in terms of civil rights and freedom. So what do you think, how do you think these amendments helped these former slaves, these now freed African Americans in their lives? I'll just take one student response. It looks like we've got somebody raising their hand. Uh, I think, I think we've got some folks maybe from Youngblood who have a hand up. Is this Lovett? Uh, the, it helped them get rights to vote and have freedom, but in the South, it still didn't have the same rights as the North. Okay. Okay. So how so? Explain what you mean. That means that the South made their own rules, that South, the uh, black people had to take certain tests to be able to actually vote and have freedom and property. And they had a Yes, you make a great point. Yeah, you make a great point. So um, these, these former slaves are now guaranteed the right of their freedom, their citizenship. All American men now have the right to vote. But you're right, later on, other tests and other forms of prevention come into play. And we'll actually talk a little bit more about that here in just a moment. But for most African Americans, for, but for uh, African Americans, um, what this really meant is that they became politically mobilized. Um, they joined with white allies in southern states to elect the Republican Party to power. On this next slide, we're going to look at a picture of the first elected African American senators and representatives. And these are men who were elected right after the Civil War. Um, and uh, they were, like I say, the first elected African American senators and uh, representatives. By the late 1870s, various discriminatory practices were used to prevent African Americans from exercising their right to vote, as the young man from Lubbock just told us. Literacy tests, poll taxes, intimidation, threats, and violence were all used to keep African Americans from voting. Now, during Grant's presidency, the KKK gained steam across the American South. The Klan would be responsible for thousands of deaths and would help to weaken the political power of Southern African Americans and Republicans. In reaction to the acts of terror committed by the Ku Klux Klan, we see the creation of a thing called the Enforcement Act of 1871. And this is one of our key terms for, the, for today. If you leave this lesson knowing about something, I want you to know about the Enforcement Act. This is actually very important. The Enforcement Act said, Excuse me, the Enforcement Act was passed by the 42nd United States Congress and signed into law by President Grant April 20th of 1871. It empowered President Grant to suspend the writ of habeas corpus uh, to combat the Ku Klux Klan and to uh, other white supremacy organizations. Now, does anybody out there actually know what the writ of habeas corpus is? Maybe you've heard of it before? Can we get a volunteer to come up to the camera and tell us what the writ of habeas corpus is all about? Just raise your hand if you think you know what the writ, the, excuse me, what the writ of habeas corpus is all about. Okay. Looks like we've got one hand raised, an orange shirt. See anybody else really? No. Are there some people on the bottom right, or are they just me? All right, why don't you come on up, the girl in the orange shirt. I think you might be from Lubbock. Come on up and tell us what you think the writ of habeas corpus was all about. And then we'll actually talk a little bit more about this so you all understand exactly what that was about because the writ of habeas corpus was essential to the Enforcement Act. Yes, ma'am. 
I think that it would be something that you're not allowed to do. Like you can't. Like it would be like some law that wouldn't allow people, certain people, to do something. Okay. Okay. Not a bad guess. So the writ of habeas corpus was used to bring a party who has been criminally convicted in a state court into a federal court. So basically they are taking people who have been criminally convicted at the state level up to a federal court. Now usually the writ of habeas corpus was used to review the legality of a party's arrest, imprisonment, or detention. Suspending habeas corpus meant that Grant could, without interruption, bring offenders to court and prosecute them to the fullest extent of the law. Grant actually used federal troops as opposed to what many people consider to be biased state militias to bring these Klansmen to court and prosecute them to the fullest extent of the law. Next, I want to look at another cartoon by Thomas Nast. And thank you very much for your response. So this is another cartoon by Thomas Nast. What do you notice? And I can actually take a few responses. Again, I want to point out a few things in this cartoon. But what sticks out at you? What's, what's the first thing that you notice? And it looks like we have quite a few hands raised. What are the pink shirts again? I think that's, is, it, is that, um, New Orleans and the, or Indianapolis. I think shirts. The pink shirt. Okay, we'll call on the folks. Oh, we got some. Let's do the pink shirts. We'll do the pink shirts first and then we'll go to the girl in the blue shirt. Oh, oh. we didn't hear her. Oh. Yeah, we couldn't hear you. Take your mute button off. Girls in the pink shirt, take your mute button off, please. Uh, I see a woman, and she's like. Okay. Oh. <laughs> it's coming back. Don't worry. It's coming back. <laughs> All right. One moment. There's. Um... <laughs> All right. She's back. So you know this woman, who do you think that woman is? The Statue of Liberty? The <laughs> Statue of Liberty? Liberty? Okay. Um, <laughs> justice. Okay, justice. justice? Not a bad guess, but what is, what is justice usually wear on her head, around her eyes? A, a fold thing? <laughs> not justice, right? Because she always wears a blindfold, right? Who else yeah. could that be? You said she's she's like the Statue of Liberty. What do we call that lady? <laughs> <laughs> lady Liberty, right? Yeah. So what else do you notice? Besides Lady Liberty, what else do you notice? She's like holding a sword. Yeah, and she's holding a sword, right? And there's like a dead guy on the ground, and, and there's... And who do, you, who do you think that guy on the ground is supposed to represent? Uh, African-American people? Yeah, yeah, the former slaves, right? Yeah. Do you know and, who is the group that she's holding the sword up to? White men? The, the White Men's League, right? You can see that on their yeah. flag. It says the White Men's League. They were kind of like the Ku Klux Klan. They were another white supremacy organization trying to put down African Americans. So Lady Liberty is doing what? She's what is she doing? Protecting them? Yeah, she's protecting them, right? She's holding out her sword. She's protecting them. Okay, why don't we take a response? I know I've got a girl down here in the right-hand corner of my screen. Um, I know she's up here at the camera. Why don't you go ahead and turn your mute button on there? At, um, she has a wife. From what I see, um, there is a woman holding a scale, and she's pointing a weapon of some sort, sorry, towards the man. 
What I'm thinking is that the scale re represents equality between women and men. Very good. Very good. Yeah, it's very observant. In her left hand, you can kind of see just behind her, she's holding a scale. And those are kind of like the scales of justice, right? She's trying to bring equality into this nation. That's Lady Liberty. She's defending former African Americans. And I know we have one more student who's standing right there by the camera. And why don't you go ahead and turn your mute button off and let us know what you see. Um, in the background, behind the scales, there's, I think there's a ship and maybe a gun. Right there. Okay. You see a gun. What was the other thing you saw? Uh, I think there's a ship. A, sh a ship? What else does that look like? It's kind of a round... Oh, we're getting back to it. It's kind of a round dome shape. What else could that be? A hill. Washington. Washington. Washington, D.C., right? That's the nation's capital building. So she is standing there on the same side as the nation's capital. She's holding the scales of justice. She's got a sword. She is ready for armed conflict to defend the rights of these African Americans, the former slaves. So, and there actually is a caption at the bottom. I'm not sure if you all can read that. Um, but the caption is read in Lady Liberty's voice, and she's saying, halt. This is not the way to repress corruption and to initiate the Negroes into the way of honest and orderly government. So there's a lot of things going on in that cartoon, but what that demonstrates to us is that the federal government at this point in time was willing to use armed conflict to protect the rights of these former enslaved African Americans. So what was the result of the Enforcement Act? Well, the first era of the KKK was completely dismantled and didn't actually resurface until the first part of the 20th century. Although the Ku Klux Klan was completely dismantled during Grant's presidency, discrimination against African Americans did not disappear completely. Discriminatory practices such as literacy tests were still used to prevent African Americans from exercising their right to vote. Now I want to look at another figure. This is a Louisiana literacy test from 1968. Not 1868, but 1968. I want to note that this test was to be taken in 10 minutes flat, and a single wrong, wrong answer meant a failing grade. There are 30 questions total. So now I want to try a short activity with you. Given the test time limit of 10, excuse me, now we're going to try a short activity. I would like you to work individually, so by yourselves, to answer question number 15 from this literacy test. And we'll see how you can hold up to this literacy test from Louisiana in 1968. So I'm going to advance my slide, and then you're going to see this question. And given the test time limit of 10 minutes, you'll actually only have 20 seconds to answer this question. Are you all ready? Give me your thumbs up if you're ready to answer the question. You're only going to have 20 seconds, so I want to make sure everybody's ready. Everybody's on board. Give me a thumbs up if you're ready. All right. I can see you. All right. Cool. So let's go to the next screen. Ready? Go. And if you need to write it down, feel free to write it down. Ten seconds. Stop. All right, the correct answer is E S I O N with a dot over the O. Did you get the correct answer? It looks like we've got somebody holding their answer up to the screen. I can't quite see it. Can you hold it a little bit closer? All right. Yeah, I'm having a hard time making it out. E-S-I-O-N. -E yeah, you got it right. That's pretty difficult, though, isn't it? It's kind of a trick question. So just raise your hand. Let's see a show of hands since I can see all of you on the screen. How many of you got that answer right? And be honest, how many of you got that answer right? 
How many of you didn't finish the question? And how many of you got the answer wrong? You were able to finish it, but you didn't get the right answer. All right? All right, so I'm seeing a pretty good mix here. So what do you think was the intended purpose of this test? And I'm just going to have you all walk up to the cameras and respond. What do you think was the intended purpose of this test? It's 30 questions long. You only have 10 minutes to answer. These questions are really confusing. What do you think was the purpose of the test? Yeah, go ahead, Alan. Girl in the picture. To discourage, okay, to discourage um, former slaves from trying to vote, especially since the test would be too hard for them to prob probably pass. Yeah, and you know, some of these slaves, these former slaves, weren't very well educated, so that's working against them already. But the fact that this test is so confu confusing, I think, personally, I think it would confuse me too. So it wasn't just these former African Americans who had a difficult time with this test. If everybody in the country was forced to take that test, I think they would all fail equally. What else do you think was the purpose for this test? Does anybody else have another response? Thank you very much for that. Looks like we've got somebody from this group in a red shirt, black jacket, black, black sweater. Um, to make someone fail? Yeah. Yeah, it was, it was designed to make people fail. Yeah. Yes. So, yeah, so these tests were designed to keep African Americans from voting. Yes, they now had the right to vote under the Constitution because of the 15th Amendment, but people and organizations in the American South went to great lengths to make sure they couldn't, in, couldn't vote, including instilling these literacy tests, which as we've seen, were nearly impossible to pass. If you got one of those questions wrong, you failed. And of course, they also wanted to ensure that the citizens had the right to vote, or excuse me, the education to vote, but that was another factor at the time. From the beginning of U.S. history until today, who has had the right to vote in this country has changed. So going back to our opening question about fairness, when, from our modern perspectives, is it fair to deny United States citizens the right to vote? And I just want to take a response from one of our schools. Come up and tell me when you think it's fair to deny a United States citizen the right to vote today. Or is it? Um, if you're too young. Looks like we've got some... If you're too young, yeah, certainly that's a barrier to entry, isn't it? Yeah, if you're under 18, you're not allowed to vote in this country, so age is important. What else? What are some other barriers of voting? Yes, ma'am. Have you not a citizen yeah. or um, haven't been living here long enough? Okay, yeah, if you're not a citizen, or if you're not a what? Or hasn't been living here enough? We're kind of breaking up, but I heard you say, yeah, if you're not a citizen, unfortunately, you're not allowed to vote. We here at the Grand Historic Site actually have naturalization ceremonies, and those are ceremonies where you actually swear in new U.S. citizens, and a lot of those folks, right after they get sworn in, will come straight into this room where I'm sitting right now and sign up to vote. That's the thing that a lot of them are eager to do. So if you're not a citizen in this country, you can't vote. But here are a few other barriers that I thought of. First of all, men. All you guys out there, I know of you. I know a lot of you are in sixth grade, but I think we have some seventh to twelfth graders in there. If you turn 18 and you're a man, you're eligible to vote, but only if you sign up for selected service first. You actually have to sign up, and if there was ever a draft, you could act, actually be drafted as a soldier for the army. Um, but um, even though we don't have the draft anymore, you still have to sign up for selective service, and that's one other barrier to entry. One other interesting barrier to entry that I found was incarcer incarceration. So if you go to jail in this country, 
Except for in Maine and Vermont, where it's, where it's legal to vote while you're in jail, it's illegal. If you are incarcerated in jail or prison, you are no longer allowed to exercise your right to vote unless you live in Maine or Vermont. So those were some other barriers to entry. So I hope that now you have a better understanding of Ulysses S. Grant and his dedication to civil rights. In conclusion, President Grant's role in securing the full political equality of all American men, regardless of color, is unsurpassed in presidential history. Even after the popular will overwhelmingly turned against the president's efforts to protect the political and civil rights of former slaves, Ulysses S. Grant refused to abandon his commitment to those for whose freedom he had fought. So at this point, does anybody have any questions for me? I know we just have a couple of minutes left here. Anybody have any questions for me? I think I see a hand up there at Birchwood. Birchwood. <laughs> um, Birchwood. Okay. So in the Fourteenth Amendment, it was talking about um, being like born or naturalized in America. Mm -hmm. What does mm -hmm. naturalized mean? Yeah, so that's actually what I just mentioned. So when you come to America as a non-U.S. citizen, you're here on a temporary status. And when you move to the United States, a lot of people start seeking citizenship. Once you've passed your citizenship test and you've gone through the entire process, you attend a ceremony called the naturalization ceremony, which is where a federal judge comes and actually swears you in as a new U.S. citizen. So naturalization is where you get sworn in as a new U.S. citizen, and mostly people who get naturalized are coming from other countries to the United States, as opposed to those who are natural born here in the United States. When you're born here in the U.S., you are automatically consi considered a, a citizen of this country. But if you move here from another nation, you have to become naturalized to become a citizen. Uh, so that's what they're talking about with the naturalization um, there in the 14th. Amendment. Any other questions? I see we've got a few folks, one group from um, the group with the pink shirts. Um, how long do you have to be a citizen for to vote? That's a good question. So you actually don't have to wait. Um, as soon as you become a citizen, a lot, of, like I say, a lot of these folks who are naturalized will sign up as soon as they are sworn in as U.S. citizens. And once you have registered to vote, you are eligible to vote in any U.S. election. So you don't actually have to wait after becoming a citizen. Once you have your status as a citizen and you've registered to vote, then you are allowed to vote in the next upcoming election if that's your choice. Um, so that's, that's something that's pretty cool about this nation, is that you're allowed to exercise that right to vote. And I have time for just one more question. Um, yes, sir, in the black shirt. If you spoke a different language, could you still vote? Yes. Yeah, just because you don't speak English doesn't mean you don't have the right to vote. And that's, you know, that's, that's the kind of barrier to entry that we've tried to, tried to overcome in our modern society. So folks who vote and don't speak English, um, I'm not sure what amenities they have available for them, but I'm sure if you didn't speak English and you went to vote, that somebody at that facility would either translate for you, or perhaps you could use an application on your phone like Google Translate, or something to help you vote. Um, there are accommodations in place for folks um, who um, maybe don't read or speak English, or in other instances are blind and or deaf. So we make accommodations for these people so they are able to vote just like everybody else. Good question. All right, I think I'm out of time. Thank you all very much for attending today's program on Ulysses S. Grant and his work with civil rights. Again, my name is David. I'm a guide at the Ulysses S. Grant National Historic Site. And just as a reminder, if you're ever in St. Louis, Missouri, be sure to stop by and visit us here at the Ulysses S. Grant National Historic Site. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you. Thank you.